first place for a seminar. And we launched a series of seminars that we lead to our summer event, a sustainable rate challenge organized by Green Vision by Living Laboratory for Sustainability. So we are starting with a seminar focusing on heritage and planning. And the next uh, seminar will be on energy and carbon, visibility and costing, and uh, management and behavioral issues. Uh, the speakers for today are Oliver Smith for Fit Studio. And uh, he's an architect and he has uh, great experience in uh, uh, planning issues through building in uh, Cambridge and in historic environments. And uh, Kayla is a PhD student at the engineering department at the Center for Sustainable Development. Uh, so okay, oh, I was going to talk. Um I would come on to areas of policy, but I was really going to talk generally about the case study for a uh, for retrofit, sustainable retrofit of a, of a historic building. A um, bit of background, we're, we're a local practice. We've got studios in Cambridge, we've got a studio in London. Uh, we do new buildings, uh, old buildings, huge master plans. We're currently doing the New River Park, connects the Olympic Park to River Thames, three miles of public parkland. Uh, and we're doing, we're doing a new port um, in Cambridge. I mean, why? Why bother to make our built heritage sustainable? It's a familiar quote, but it's kind of unavoidable. Um, why make you call sustainable? I, I think I mean, the barriers to, to um, sustainable retrofit are often talked about in terms of policy and finance. I don't think they are remotely the problems. The problems are the clients don't understand why they should bother. If it's just about lower bills, then jam tomorrow is not enough of an incentive. Uh, we we wanted to tackle this, it was a problem that someone needed to tackle, and we looked around for the right project. Uh, we identified Trinity as the ideal client, they've got the resources to, to do this kind of thing properly. They understood the longer term arguments in terms of the relationship between their refurbishment cycle of their buildings and the scale at which the, the speed of the climate is changing and the speed at which the regulatory context is changing. They're able to take a longer term view of energy price. They've got significant carbon reduction commitments they've got to meet. And they, they were more swayed by the well-being, comfort, and productivity arguments related to well-being, thermal comfort, uh, kind of air quality, than actually they were about how many pounds of CO2 their electricity and gas bills. So the arguments for the sustainable retrofit, I think, lie more there. And I think when you're talking, when you're talking to the, to talking about retrofit of office spaces, then there is no case yet for tenants will pay more rent because they're going to have lower bills. But there is really a case if you link it to the HR issue of tenants will pay more rent if they think their staff are going to stay longer, be more productive, be happier. That's that's the big area that no one's really put, put quantities on yet. So you've got built in 1822, Williams Wilkins, Grade One listed, it's next to the Rain Library, it's part of the kind of historic Cambridge riverfront. It we are from, we are giving it uh, it currently has 200 rooms in very weird patterns of occupancy. We're making 159 student rooms. Um, two thirds of those share loos and showers and dips. A third of them are en suite. We're providing uh, accessible rooms for those teaching sets because Trinity, again, are looking forward to the way in which education is going to be delivered in the next 30 years, not how it's delivered now. The days of one to one supervisions are probably numbered. They're going to be in groups of six or plus. So we're, we're building new kinds of teaching sets, uh, seminar rooms, and completely new services installation. We're, we're addressing the, the, the character and the comfort of the room, that's the primary driver, but we're doing that through a kind of integrated package of fabric and systems uh, installations. So we're making, well, I'll come on to it in more detail, but um, so we're making the building much more comfortable by uh, addressing its insulation, its energy losses. Uh, putting in underfloor heating rather than you know, being able to power local radiators. We're putting in mechanical ventilation heat recovery using the old chimneys because they're there on this fantastic distribution route. And we're running all the underfloor heating off a ground source heat pump. But each of those things, if you presented them to the City Council and English Heritage as a, as a shopping list of this is what we want to do, you'd have got very few of them. So presenting it as an integrated package where that things actually tied together and they can see how one leads to the other or adds, adds to the other, much more persuasive. And the third is we're actually improving the heritage quality of the building by 
renewing the fabric of the elevations, opening up the old shutters and making things like that work again. Um, the outcomes are um, that we're going to reduce the carbon emissions by by about 88%, a bit more according to Max Forman. Uh, and a very wise man said the way you can get to 88% carbon reductions is to half the, half the energy demand of building, double the efficiency of the equipment that meets that demand, and then half the carbon in the supply. It's a really good rule of thumb of how to get to an eighth of your carbon. We're not doing it quite that way because every building is particular, but it was a really good, it was a really good rule of thumb to work to. So we're, we're, we're reducing demand by 60% by insulating the, insulating the ground floor of the roof easily. Putting uh, insulation on the inside face of external listed walls, which is the problem. Uh, we're reducing the air leakage, which is phenomenal. It's 19 mm -hmm. meters per square at the moment. We're going to reduce it to three. Uh, we're putting daylight into spaces that didn't have daylight before. By, you know, there were, they're, they're in that funny old building, there are cupboards with bigger windows than rooms. I mean, we're just replanning for so uh, then we're um, increasing the efficiency. We're not achieving uh, a doubling the efficiency. We've got a 43% increase in efficiency of the systems. So that's to do with lighting, ventilation equipment, and control systems. And then we're doing quite badly on the uh, decarbonizing the supply. We're, we've got 55% reduction. That's because it's okay. But that's with ground source heat pump and PV generation. So altogether, you get down to somewhere between 88 and 90%. Four things we needed to understand before we could propose this were the agency landscape, and Kayla's going to talk about this, we're into depth, but uh, that's, that, that's the thing that, that all the policies are there, it's just that people in the industry can't understand them. Uh, but looking at policies local and national, understanding the building fabric and its character, and putting together, as I've already said, a package of work that's integrated and can't be picked apart. Agency landscape's really weird. Um, English, no one from English Heritage here? Now, uh, English Heritage is a weird organisation that operates in silos. So they have really good people in strategic planning and, and scientific advisors, environmental intelligence, writing really good policies about, about sustainability and climate change. They have really good people, technical people looking at environmental studies and conservation technology department, who know that we've got a retrofit buildings and they're really keen to work out exactly how, and they're commissioning really good pieces, really good studies. But they sit several branches apart from the guys who actually deal with these things on site and who are the bane of a lot of colleges' life and the University of London who historic building inspectors who are scarcely aware of what's going on in other silos and certainly don't understand it. And when you say that well, these are your adopted policies from head office, they go, yeah, but, you know, um, it doesn't really apply to us or we don't think it applies to the project. So you have to understand that and you have to find ways of short-circuiting and crossing across that. There's a, there's a fantastic body of independent technical advisors. So Caledonian, Glasgow Caledonian University doing amazing work on building properties. Archimetrics are independent advisors, but they work for SPAR, they work for English Heritage, they work for Historic Scotland, all about understanding. They've done all that, the very good work about institute new values. So you plug in your old building into build desk or whatever, new value calculation software, and it'll give you a really dreadful value. If you actually measure it, because old buildings aren't built very well, by and large, the U-value would be much better. In, in reality, the performance of our walls, we've got a U-value of 0.7 on, according to a computer model, it should have been 1.4. That's the wall is performing twice as well in reality as the, the rather simplistic um, software predicts that we should. And that's because there are holes in it. There are gaps in it, there's lime mortar that's fallen to bits, there's the walls. Old, old fabric work generally performs a lot better than people suspect. Because of the holes? Oh, well, okay, a, 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 a brick from the 1820s is more full of, of, of voids and gaps and, uh, that, than, than, the, than the modern abstract model of a brick as made under modern European legislation and rules of conformity, regularity, density, whatever. And they're laid more badly. I mean, there are more gaps in the wall, there are more air pockets. And then there are Bill Bordas and Brian Rudat who are, who are experts in um, Bill's a general purpose expert, Brian Rouse, expert in timber decay. Chris Wood used to be at English Heritage, he's an independent advisor on um, conservation research. And then you've got all these other bodies that, ma that match English Heritage, but are much more, um, much more open minded. Historic Scotland recommend double glazing for the windows. 
had a, a really promoting the, the retro, sustainable retrofitted movement. The Georgian group um, get quite fond, get quite attached to old bits of plaster, but can see that all that's got to change. I mean, there there are people who have got their minds much more on, on the current situation and, um, and various silos and, and areas of negotiation. So you have to understand that and, um, and exploit the support of SPAT or the Georgian group in order to overcome resistance from negotiated or even play with some negotiated off against each other. Okay, so that's a problem. The initiators themselves have some fantastic policies about sustainability. They recognise that you can that the authenticity of a building might rely, might reside more in its use than particular bits of fabric. But the most important thing that a college building is it stays a college building that is used, it can't be museums. And and there are really good policies about how you can intervene in them. And that you don't have to. When you when when you build a new wall, pretend it's always been there and cover it with a cornice and mould these things. I mean you are allowed to do contemporary stuff. It's much cheaper to do contemporary stuff. But so those policies are all there. There's just a kind of yeah, but from the local officers. The city council have great policies. The city council also have a very good historic core um, appraisal where they've actually looked at every building in the historic core and say, this is what we think is important about it. So you can work with that and assess how to This is the building we did. It's the cover of their sustainable design construction document. Um, but they also want to apply uh, rules about renewable energy to old buildings as well as new buildings. So there, the city council are pretty much pretty much up for it. Uh, they just need a pound. Um, so we analysed New Court to death. We took thousands of photographs of every corner of it, so we really knew what its strengths and weaknesses and character and problems were. It enabled us to lead the conversation with the charity about this is this is a hierarchy of spaces, this is what's good about them, this is what's bad about them, and maintain the upper hand in all that conversation. We did a huge amount of, of uh, monitoring of the existing fabric, so we knew exactly how it performed, what the moisture inputs were, what the thermal inputs were, where we were leaking air, how much air we were leaking, what the U values actually were, what the pro material properties of the brick were. I mean, it sounds very complicated, just take some bricks, send them to Glasgow two weeks later, you get the figures, you can build it into your model. It's, it's really quite low-grade stuff. The sophisticated stuff is the um, Wolfie Modeling, this is a program, uh, developed in the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, and it predicts up to 30 years ahead what the conditions in a wall are going to be. Um, Mind you, rubbish in, rubbish out. So you use the, it comes with a database of standard materials, but if you plug in your real materials and you plug in real Cambridge weather as re recorded by a real Cambridge weather station, then you can actually get a relevant model. And you can calibrate it, because you can build in monitoring into the wall, and you can run real-time monitoring against real-time predictions. What was the name of the model? It's called Woofy, W-U-F-I. It's, it's the kind of industry standard moisture of the... So this, this shows, um, this is the old wall. It shows uh, 60 mil of um, private entry, which is a big permeable timber um, insulation. And what happens to the, the moisture and the uh, temperature. So the temperature clearly rises. This is the highest on the inside face. But it falls quite gradually there and then falls more slowly through the brick. The moisture in the brickwork is higher at the outside where you've got into the brain, but actually it drops off. And we, we studied hundreds of different versions of insulation, different kinds of vapor foam insulation against vapor closed insulation, different ways of building it to make a compelling case for why we should do what we wanted to do. And that was the first step in this kind of integrated package of work. Air tightness, we were just going to seal up all the holes in the wall, not with membranes or tapes, which is kind of high tech and walls would be very fallible, but with lime render. You just parge and it will lime and you get the air tightness you need. Then we insulate. By that time, any uh, heat losses are down to a level that we can keep building with unfloor heating, run off a ground source heat pump, which is a low temperature. So that's where we're going to get some significant. Reductions, and we're sending to the English heritage, and we're going to take away all the radiators and the pipes. You'll love it. Mm -hmm. uh, then, because one of, one of the issues with making a building airtight is you then need to ventilate out humidity, smell, and whatever. So, we're using a mechanical ventilation system. You've got, a, you've got that extract from all those showers and those kitchens anyway, so why not recycle the heat out of it? provide fresh air to the rooms. The Danish Czech University published an amazing series of papers on 
on the performance. They've done it on, worked on schools and office buildings, on the, the performance and productivity of, of staff and students with higher air quality and greater thermal comfort, and it's dramatic. I mean, particularly dramatic in school buildings, but it's noticeable in office buildings. So providing greater comfort, thermal and, and in terms of in terms of pollutants, really, CO2, water vapour, VOCs, the other stuff that's in the air. There, there, there are real benefits in um, providing fresh air, people fresh air supply. And then we're hoping to run the, uh, the pump for the uh, for heating off uh, an array of photovoltaics mounted on the, the elevation of the building that faces over down Hostel Lane. Uh, in terms of the design issues, English Heritage has said we don't think all of that science is going to work, but if it, even if it does, there are problems with design and intervene in a grade or listed building. So when we answered all the science questions, we said, and uh, we built a full-size mock-up room. These are photos, photos of a mock-up room where we, we, we produce the detail where our insulated lining comes up, stops just short of the ceiling. That's so you can see the old cornice. We don't rip the old cornice off and stick it on the face of the wall. Do enough analysis to show that's not going to be a cold bridge problem, which isn't. Uh, and you say, here is a simple plane of insulation. That's your know, contemporary, subtly, subtly legible intervention in the existing building. Take all the shutters and the windows out, and you insulate round behind the shutters. You double glaze the windows. And um, so we built, so the left hand image is a computer view, the right hand image is actually a whole bunch of 10 models. And then, um, in between those, we've got this full size mock up to try out colleges of what college wanted to do with the. There's a second line which is to do with services distribution, so you don't chase the services um, either through your insulation or into your historic um, And the design integrity of that was informed by conversations that go back to images of Sudurania cell and how you occupy a much larger building than something's habitable. A lot of full size, that's about real size. The maquettes of, of, of the details, and the hundreds of those, and then an the full size model. So, um, English Heritage Conservation Office has just led through step by step. At every stage, they have to make some kind of response. Well, I prefer this to that. Well, we'd say that we, and you can build on that over a longish period of consultation. Mm -hmm. uh, the double glazing was a big political issue, which the city was brilliant on, but English Heritage. But you just have to show you, you examine every other kind of way of upgrading the efficiency of the windows. 15 different uh, models we looked at. Uh, from operational energy saving, uh, humidity condensation risk, um, and visual intrusion, actually. Second in double glazing, which is what all the heritage authorities really like, is really visually intrusive from inside or outside. And if you look at a, a listed building that's had second in double glazing, you see this funny kind of shadow of the original glazing bars. Just looks like a slightly deadened building. And from inside you can never open the windows properly, if you can you can close them properly. And there was a, what we discovered was there was a tipping point of where solutions became. So this is peak ethos. So there were four solutions that worked in terms of energy. But three of them didn't work in terms of operation, maintenance and moisture risk. So we we said Obvious thing to do is to double glaze the existing casements. That's what we're going to need. Um, so, yeah, here's, here's, here's two windows in Downey. One's got secondary double glazing, the one next to it's got piece of glass, which is this um, normal double glazing. You can see the difference from the outside, and then you can certainly see the difference from the inside. We, we've made a, a replica window, we put his glass in it, and we said to English Heritage, who were going, oh, it's alien technology, you mustn't do it, it's really going to spoil the character of the building. One of these windows has got his glass in. If you can find it in 10 minutes, we'll believe it. And they could. You know, it just isn't. You know, it's, it's very subtle. And they have to admit, well, oh, yeah, we can find it. So that finally, what, um, the, way, the way to frame these conversations up in terms of planning and policy is to break down the decisions that have to be made. Um, traditionally, if English heritage said no, the local authorities tend to Actually, when you examine what's, what's, what's being asked, the first question is, what are the heritage values of the existing building and what are their relative significances? Well, the biggest, the most important single value of, of, a, of, a, of a listed building, or of Newport specifically, but hundreds of other buildings in Cambridge, 
is that they're still doing what they were doing, what they were originally built for. The most important thing about Newport is it's still a student residence, and it has been since 1825. That's more important than individual bits of plaster or, or specific bits, elements of architecture or fabric. And, and that's, that's all taken straight from English Heritage's own guidance. And English Heritage should be part of the, uh, they should be part of the discussions about this, because very often they find that they agree with you. So the second question, question is, to what extent will the proposals harm or benefit these values? So you're doing some bad things. You might be um, putting a plane of insulation inside a wall, which will be visible. That, will, that, will, that might be a harm, might be a benefit, but they tend to regard it as a harm. Uh, but you're also opening up the shutters. Well, that's a benefit. Does that equal it? Does it cancel it out? You're re-rendering the building, putting back a nice ochre render rather than a horrible 1970s pink render. Is that good or bad? Well, it's probably good. So English Heritage definitely get involved in these questions as well with, with the local authority. Um, but the third question's got nothing to do with them at all, which is, if there are any harms, any residual harms, are they balanced by any other benefits? And here, you bring in the whole rate of local authority policies to do. Might be to do with job creation, uh, might be to do with border region or uh, local regeneration policies, it, specifically in Cambridge, it's to do with the Cambridge's policies on the uh, cutting carbon emissions. And that lies completely outside the sphere of influence in the churches. That is really one for the local officers and the local, the local planning committee. And when we set, it, set the questions out like that to Cambridge, they felt enormously empowered. They said, actually, we've really thought about it like that before. So we can feel all of the um, comments from the heritage about the heritage side. And then we're going to bring in our, our sustainability. So we're going to bring in people to do with townscape, people to do with visit Cambridge. We talk about all the other policies that might be affected by this, and you know, there was really no sustainability, but what was brilliant was they began to realise that it has much bigger context, and that the final decisions, should you do this or not, that isn't really done. It's only to do with heritage against other things. And, uh, and that, was very, that was very empowering. So Cambridge said, we're going to give it planning consent, these buildings must evolve with their true main environment use and not become museums. English Heritage got the heels in a bit. So it went to Eric Pickles, who said, um, partly it suited his localism agenda, but he said, these, these are policies that must, these are decisions that must be made at the local level. That, that actually, this, this project doesn't raise any conflict with the national policies on important matters, it doesn't raise significant architectural and urban design issues. He said, it's down to local authorities and it should be dealt with as heritage against carbon reductions and, and on our buildings, other factors that might come into play, like the to do with employment or, or the deprivation or whatever. So, a really good decision, made for probably all the wrong reasons. But, um, so that's it, and that's what we're doing. And it starts on site in the state of Vermont. Do you have time for a couple of questions? Yeah, I've got plenty. When will the graduate be starting for the new course? Will it be? When will the improvement be started? Are we start in, in um, contractors appointed on 17th of May. 17th? Yeah. So that's four years to go. No, 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 no. So he'll start digging and, some, and, and uh, doing work in two months' time. Yeah. And uh, we're going to do it in three phases because there's actually a lot of rooms and the college can't afford to yeah. count the whole courtyard. So we're going to do it in three phases. So uh, we'll finish in uh, Christmas 2015. Okay. But the first phase will be finished this time next year. This time next year. So you've got to come and visit. How long was the radio the project? Pardon? When did you start? Um, we started three years ago. It's taken a long time. But we had to invent, I mean, the, the, going back to the beginning, I mean, we had to invent a method. Because if you'd just gone to the city council and said, um, we want to achieve this, they'd just have said no. So you had to work out, you had, before you started designing anything, you had to work out. What are the issues? And who are, what, what, is the, what is the agency context? What is the policy context? What does the college want to achieve? So, you know, carbon emissions. But we, had to, we had to work out what is that, the kind of landscape policies and, and agencies. 
what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, we have to work out. We have to make sure we knew the building better than anyone else, so that you couldn't sit down at the table and be embarrassed about something that you threw up that you thought of. And we realized it had to be completely, had to be a, yeah, a completely integrated and sort of, not, not watertight, but because it has to allow for change. It had to be, it had to be presented as if it was a, or would be considered as a holistic piece of work, not, oh, would it be nice to do this, and oh, would it be nice to do that? They actually all just that crap and complement each other. Uh, it sounds like you're like, well, in the beginning, you probably did a lot of consultations, right, when you established this. Um, so based on the policy context, you established what your project would give a value to this policy context, right, in terms of sustainability, carbon reductions, and so mm -hmm. on. So how it's influenced the position of English heritage already, probably, as part of the debate? Did they look at it more broader, or did you have it? Um, English heritage, I mean, it, it hit English heritage at just the wrong time, because they just had their budget cut by 40%. They were commissioning something which is now going to be produced by DEC, which was a kind of triage system for interventions in existing buildings that there were border houses producing. Uh, so they thought they were going to be in a really strong position, and then suddenly, oh, we've actually had to just drop all that work. <coughs> um, so they were sort of led by us. Um, they tried to hope it would go away. They had tried to hope that you know, we couldn't make things work. Um, and they ended up uh, adopting a very traditional, actually, we don't like this, we don't like that. You know, a nine-page letter identifying all the little details they didn't, they weren't happy with. So they didn't look at it in the broader light. Um, I've had a couple of meetings with them since, where they realised that you know, this is this is, this has happened and this is going to happen and there are going to be more, and that they desperately see need to be seen to be part of the solution or part of the problem. They just can't work out. I'm trying to set up a seminar with them to discuss these kind of projects, what the typical issues are, what, what they might, what positions they might sensibly sustainably adopt. Because if they're endlessly bypassed, then and which bits not to bother with, and which bits, we know an awful lot more about that than the, the, the building physics side. Yeah. Much. Yeah, it took a long time to read through all the policies and work out where the gaps were and where the, where the things were to exploit. So with all of that stuff we have now. And yeah, I think, I think we can do it in a year or what took us three years to do. It depends when you start. You need to start with building monitoring. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Some very modern materials and some traditional materials. Could you just give a couple of examples of how you made those choices? Um, well, the, the insulation is the kind of modern, and that's a more recycled good fiber. That's a stuff, yeah. And we just we just um, mm -hmm. tested. We got all the, all the insulation manufacturers to give us their all their material characteristics in terms of vapor mm -hmm. transport, liquid transport, and whatever. Put them all in, we just worked out which one which one was best. Um, yeah, otherwise, I would say we're using a lot of traditional materials. And that's mainly because the British construction industry is pretty rubbish. <coughs> Compared with continental building industry, or even the American building industry. Presenting them with some high-tech uh, vapor membranes or air tightness membranes and tapes unless you actually stand and look over their shoulder, they are not going to achieve what you want them to achieve. So you have to use technologies which are actually pretty loose fit and pretty easy for them to get right. Um, so it was very much aimed at what we thought the local you know, the British industry was going to be able to do. And we had, we had um, mid-tender interviews with three contractors earlier in the week. And it's clear there's only one national contractor who's actually got their heads around sustainable construction. And, and one of the others, uh, our local guy, was saying it is so far outside our, our, our sort of sphere of comfort that we we're not even sure we can price it. Well, they can be out of business as soon as they carry on. So it's, um, you have to, it has to be 
that's the aim that what we think the competences are, because there's no point in having very high ambition and then failing to get it simply as we just call it work completely or correctly. Question. Did you have any discussions about the concept of setting? Which was oh. setting which is recently introduced. So how and how it was debated in this <coughs> sorry. Um, yes, and the setting of Cambridge and the backs and that particular area of Cambridge is characterised by its endless reinvention. And all of those buildings have changed enormously since they were constructed, one way or another. And, uh, and I don't think ASPIC is a very good long term strategy for conservation. If, if, um, if Cambridge colleges couldn't safely or sensibly inhabit their buildings, then they would build new buildings um, on the northwest Cambridge side. And the central Cambridge would become a very different place because it would be largely empty. So, again, setting, setting has to include occupation and use rather than just the kind of physical manifestation of building. Otherwise, you, you really don't miss something. And, and you know, occupancy, occupancy uses of building, you know, occupancy and energy uses are a really large part. So on this building, uh, there will be a little notice by the window saying if you open your window during the heating season, your heating will go out. Yeah, if you open it for more than 10 minutes, the heating will go out. Because you have to, you have to educate. Um, we are going to have to educate our building users in the future. We're going to hit the kind of targets we need to hit. And, um, and you can either do that in a very didactic and bossy way, or you can do it gently through um, from learning, you know, and let them learn that we can get off and, and uh, they will start using the room more appropriately. You know, you have fresh tempered air to into your room, don't block the grill. Mm. And let's make sure, you know, once, once a week your bed will check that you haven't blocked the grill. Because people will, you know, they'll, they'll take it into bits and try and work out and how they can cheat on the on the um, meter with the heat in their room. You have to, so if you go back to the question, you have to think about a much broader cultural setting than just the architectural. Presumably you also involved like all the staff of the college and everyone was yeah, very from, much. From, from the housekeepers right through to the maintenance men and the um, so the Trinity being very demanded in terms of the intellectual rigor. I mean they've taken it on board not only as a building project but as a as a kind of research project. So I've had more trouble justifying some of the the uh, the intellectual arguments and I have justifying the expenditure or the kind of spatial rules. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could talk about um, professionally, industry wise, the implications for let's say people with normal budgets and time scales. So, 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 so like you? people with normal budgets and time scales. So someone like Trinity maybe has longer objective and they can have that kind of weight. What sort of lessons or well, how do you see this applying? I mean, it's really important. I mean, it, I think um, the, the thought was that somehow the Green Deal would, would mean that there was a kind of bottom up use and development of appropriate technology and sustainable retrofit. I don't think that happens because I think that I'm not convinced that the Green Deal assessors necessarily understand the problem in the, as holistically as they should. But I think that it's incumbent on the people who do have the assets and the resources that. To do the research to find out what some of the answers are and what some of the kind of key pitfalls and what some of the key um, the, the, the key issues to be addressed are, you know, whether that's policy or, or building fabric or construction, whatever. So I think that um, I think there will be I think it's more information trickles down much better than it trickles up. I think that the um, dissemination of this stuff and the certainly the, all of the all of the building physics which and, and policy analysis we've done is all on the all on the um, planning portal website. And we're going to we're going to monitor the building for 30 years to make sure that it, it actually behaves the way we think it will and all of that stuff will be publicly available. And we're already doing quite a lot of kind of books and lots of other there's, there's um there are some a number of kind of key drivers, kind of kind of policy things coming up like the Energy Act 2018. 
um, I, I might be wrong, but my, by my calculation, there's about 20, between 22 and 25 billion pounds of listed heritage in London that's rented. So that will capture the energy act. I mean, that's Grosvenor Street, Crown County State, Cadogan State, Howard, London, Portland. Um, they've got to improve all of those buildings to get an EPC or new or better. So they're starting to say, well, can we talk to you and can we find out how, how you did that? What are the key lessons? So that's, that's a huge, it's a huge uh, uh, dissemination exercise. Um, then beyond that, there's the greenhouse gas thing. So the C top 250 firms are having to do an annual report on their carbon footprint, broken down. So buildings is quite a large part of that. So Hi, okay, it might be at the high end, even slightly remotely high end of industry is beginning to get their brains around, around retrofit of properties. So I think, again, but that's stuff that's trickle down. Already. And I think, I think that, that hoping that it was going to be invented at, 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 at grassroots level is, is, is really important. I think the policies are all there. So I think that um, it's, it's, it's pointing out to local authorities and, and the agencies that they have those policies and they should, they should read them. So, and I think it's incumbent on, on people actually to do this work and disseminate it. And again, we see that as being part of their, their role. Have yeah. you already monitored any energy use behaviour in these buildings? Um, we haven't monitored, we've monitored, we've installed one room of this insulation and then we know that it's performing better than we thought it was. We haven't actually put anyone in the room yet. <laughs> and, and we can't really do that until we've got the whole installation of the underboard heating and mechanical ventilation system in. Mm -hmm. But in terms of heat loss, we know that we're using less than we thought we would, and we know that we have got less of a proper interstitial moisture than we thought we would. Um, how about occupant behaviour patterns? Well, we, so we haven't put anyone in the room yet. So oh, I see. But where will you keep monitoring it? Yeah, we're, we're building in. Um, Quarter of a million pounds worth of monitoring equipment. How long will it be for well, the monitoring? Well, the first phase will be occupied not this September, but the following September. So from then on, we'll be monitoring all aspects of the of the use of the building system. So, yeah, if someone plugs in a, a George Foreman steak grill and runs it, then you know, cooks three steaks for every meal, we'll, we'll pick up that they're doing that, but not necessarily why until we knock on the door and ask them why their energy use is, mm -hmm. interest use is so high. But we'll be able to tell what, what the heat inputs into the room are, what the uh, lighting and um, the lighting uses, what the ventilation rate is, and uh, what the temperature is, what heat loss is, what the moisture and thermal conditions in the joint, in the joinery, in the wall, and in the floor are. We'll know quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, <coughs> you, you the time. Uh, well, I, yeah, I should, I'm now a bit late for a meeting, but I was a bit late coming here, so I sort of thought I... <laughs> yeah, okay, well, is there perhaps time for one more, one more Yeah, one more question. Do you consider, when all this work's been done, do you consider it now a sustainable building and that it's achieved everything that can be achieved? I think it's achieved everything that can be achieved at the moment. <laughs> I mean, we're building in, um, for example, more cable ducts to the roof mm -hmm. because we think we can put in more room, I think, solar. Solar thermal technology is, is a changing really quickly. So we're building in the capacity to, to add or to change what we've done there. I think the, um, in terms of the fabric, I think, I mean, you can only know what you know at the time. I mean, given what we know now about building physics, we're doing as much as we can. Uh, so I think that's, you know, we have to say yes um, and then um, see what happens. But certainly the way we're doing it doesn't preclude going back and adding. Yes, I would say it is a stable building, and I'm on that kind of 88% reduction where we're meeting the government's target for 2050. Um, but the, the longer question, which the client wants answering, is what about future climate? So we're looking at all that probabilistic data that comes out of the UK SIP, and, and it depends which, which what the likelihood of emissions reducing, stabilizing, or increasing are, but under Certainly under the moderate emissions and the extreme emissions, the building will be fine. We might have, they might have to plant 
creeper on the, on the west face of the building to cut down um, rain and to, sh to provide some additional sunscreen from the stone face. But you know, it's possible to do it with measures like that, which are quite friendly. Um, but all the gutters and things like that have been sized to deal with the increased um, rainfall. Well, not increased rainfall, but the increased concentration of rainfall in the most extreme future climate change scenarios. Um, I'm pretty sure the, the Erasmus heat pumps are going to work. We can, um, temperature goes up by more than three degrees, we can run the heat pumps in reverse in the summer and provide underfloor cooling rather than underfloor heating. I mean, we wouldn't run up below 13 degrees and stuff with compensation problems. But, so we're building in capacity for future adaptation and Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.